here today to celebrate the publication of two new poetry books, David Keplinger's The Most Natural Thing and Judith Harris's Night Garden. David Keplinger is the author of The Rose Inside, which won the 1999 T.S. Eliot Prize, The Clearing, which won the Colorado Book Award, and most recently, The Prayers of Others. He teaches at American University, where he's a director of the creative writing department. Judith Harris is the author of two previous poetry collections, Atonement and The Bad Secret. She's also written Signifying Pain, Constructing and Healing the Self Through Writing. Her poems, essays, and reviews have appeared in many publications, including Spoon River Review, The Nation's Slate, Plowshares in the New Republic, and she's taught just about everywhere in Washington, D.C., George Washington, Catholic, George Mason, and American Universities. Uh, thanks for coming, everybody, and please welcome our first poet, David Keplinger. A woman calls through her horses through the dark, corral a cloud of tantrum, tantrum kick and dirt. What is this country? Where to glean its wisdom? To be called, to be called out of darkness softly. It's the irony, the hardness in her voice, like the voices of the gods through canyons, that I have never understood. But horses do as she expects of them. They come to her soft clapping until the last, the penitent, who bends his head so she can run the metal comb along the belly, clear out the froth of white protective sweat. Uh, that poem is called Calling, and uh, for a long time I thought that it was my job to call the poems home, to um, find a way to get them to come to me. And then at a certain point, uh, you, you begin to realize that it's you that are being called to them. Um, the, the poems that I want to read today are a little bit about that. You, you have an idea about what these poems are supposed to be or what they're supposed to become, and you find that they begin talking to you and saying, uh, 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 I have other plans in mind. This is called my great-grandfather's name on a door buzzer in Agrigento. C. Falco, 1A, I'm looking for a fisherman who left this country to gather bits of tin. He came to New York City. He went from door to door or found things on the road. His face is large, his back is humped like mine. In a photograph, he points into the foreground, pieces of metals around him afloat in the grass. He sits while a woman adjusts his white hair. See Falco, the fisherman, I'm looking for my twin. I have never met him, though he held me once. His eyes are nearly closed. His forehead's creased from all this looking far away for things. And then one more poem from outside this, this collection. This is called Blue. The scalloped edge of the old time serving dish, left without its burden, glows a muted, used up blue. Not the blue of Ornette Coleman's Say It Isn't So. Not the blue of Matisse's Icarus, who fell through a forest of cut out stars but of numbness the hands achieve in snow. Passed along through the branches of our family, it now stands leaning against a mirror in the house my mother lives in in the first year without my father. The dish depicts a tree, a nest of blue, indistinguishable eggs, waiting for the nothing that's left of their mother. My mother says, it's 300 years old, a thing to move from one table to another, passing through years with emptiness to carry the eggs that singular blue, never to be eaten or broken into song. So the, the poems in The Most Natural Thing try to 
uh, start a conversation between artificiality and the natural. Uh, and so the form itself is very artificial. They're little boxes. They're all nine lines long. Um, they're prose, and uh, each poem ends exactly at that corner uh, to make a perfect square. I wanted them to be a little bit like shadow boxes where you put disparate things inside, and then those things begin to have a relationship. Uh, I wanted them to be like windows where you can only see what is in front of the window, but there's a suggestion of what's above it and what's below it and beside it. Uh, but these boxes ended up being the, the thing that I was called to, to write in this book. So I'm just going to read a series of them, uh, uh, and then um, I'll introduce uh, Judith. This poem is called Eyelids in the Dawn Years of Perspective. Time kept passing and I wasn't getting born. My parents called for me. They made me a room, erected a tiny straw bed. Grease fell and shattered into tiny bits. Then Rome took a broom to the world. It was passing before I could open my eyes, my eyelids so thin I could see apparitions, figures floating just beyond the scrim. Suddenly, Bruegel the Elder lifted a brush, tilting his horny, drunk dancers. At that point, the day and the night slammed together, which locked me in their forceps hold. This poem is called The Assumption. From its pellet-like source, the universe widens. Our car broke down near the fairgrounds that winter. There I once saw the world's tallest man harrowed by his ankylosis, his knees like liquidy magic eight balls. He sat in a chair waving at us. Then he rose as if climbing a rope. Five o'clock, just about dark, the tow truck arrived. It cranked down its hook on a chain it hoisted the bumper, lip of a fish, almost vertical. Altogether, we climbed in the truck, the father, the son, the quiet driver. This poem is, is called The Belly, and I was telling some friends yesterday that it was one, it's one of those poems that continues to haunt you, and you think you have it right, and then you say, oh, no, this is not right. And then you rewrite it, and then you think, now I can go out and celebrate. And you come home that night, and you think, oh, no, this is not right. And this went on for 10 years. <laughs> and this poem is nine lines long. So you realize we have to be insane to do this. Um, I was on a plane going to Nashville 10 years ago, and I met a woman who was Czech, and uh, I struck up a conversation with her. She had left the country in uh, 1937 as a young girl when the, uh, the Nazis uh, occupied uh, Czechoslovakia. Her mother stayed behind, and her mother, she told me, was quite a character and had been a novelist, a, a writer of children's novels, uh, and was very well known in the Czech Republic at that time. They were later reunited, and her mother recounted the story of how uh, after the children were out of the house and she was living there by herself, the Germans came, and uh, they began searching the house for the children. And uh, they searched in the closet, and they uh, looked in her purse, and the mother said, you're not going to find the children in there. And I think I lost my mic. Can you still hear me? Okay. So, uh, so that story stayed with me and haunted me. I don't know why. Children hiding in a lady's purse. Uh, until finally all of that material about the Germans, about World War II, about this woman on the plane got stripped away and I wrote this poem called The Belly. I fell into my mother's purse and out shut the world with a snap. There I lay coming to among her tubes of lipstick, box of chiclets, leather gloves. Death smelled of mint and a décolleté of Charlie. No crow was going to come to peck the artery of this whale and free me from my loneliness, snapped up tight, with very little air to last me. 
It was a feeling of such power. I was a special child. I'm afraid it got the best of me. I made a throne out of the compact puff. I ruled by my scepter, an unlit match. This poem is called The Heart. The morning before his open heart surgery, my father and I drive to Elmwood Park Zoo. But no one greets us at the gate. The stalls for the animals are suddenly gone. The zoo defunct. I think of the giraffes somewhere munching on trees, feeding on anything that will not scream. I think of the lion gorged in the woods, how his meat until now has never been heart. In the forests rise weeds, a messy world of unseparate things. Raptors above us, big cats mule, mounds of apes wake up amazed, no cages. What I found was that, and I, I know that probably many of you are, are writers in, in the audience, I found that uh, the, the form which we think constricts and limits uh, the writer actually frees the writer to, um, to say what he came to say. Um, in my case, it was uh, hard for me to know what to leave out of the poem and what to keep in. As in that story of the woman from Czechoslovakia, uh, I would have probably included all of it had it not been for the limitations of form. But once I stripped it away from the poem, I found that what was always meant to be there, what was calling me to, to, to bring it forth, uh, um, was, was able to take the center stage. That was true of this poem, too. It's called The Larynx. Let my grandfather eat in his silence again, except for the scrape of his fork. Let him make a little sound when food rains through the laryngectomy. Let him spin a column of spaghetti and chew slowly, filling himself until he's fat wide and fat. Let him pluck sardines and chew their bones inside his mouth. Who am I to say? I'll ask no questions of my grandfather. My grandfather asks no questions of me. The meal is finished. And with that, with that weight, let him push from the head of the table. And just a uh, a couple more here. The, these last two poems are the, the final two poems in the, in the collection. Uh, and uh, a brief note about where this started. I, I was writing a lot of poems about parts of the, the body, um, and that had been inspired by an event in my life, which I attribute to the making of this book. Uh, I was uh, awoken one morning at 7 o'clock. Um, I was living on Wisconsin Avenue, and I heard all of these police sirens and horns um, beeping and, and people uh, shuffling around outside my window. And I walked over to my, my shade and opened the window and looked out and I saw four policemen standing like this in front and then facing something that I couldn't see because it was right over here where, my, where the entry to my condo building is. So there are the four policemen looking like this, ready for the attack, and I thought, well, what the hell's over there? And I, I, I pushed my shade down, and I looked over and just barely caught a glimpse to my direct right of a completely nude man <laughs> standing there on the front steps of, of my building. It's the, it's the buildings right across from the cathedral. So you can imagine rush hour, 7 o'clock, everyone's beeping, and he's waving and standing there, you know, <laughs> completely nude. Not naked, nude. So <laughs> there's a difference. So... Uh, I, I, I watched this, this thing unfold, and I thought, well, this has to be some kind of mistake. He got locked out of the building. You know, this, th th this, is, this is all just a, you know, a big error. And, and so finally, one of the policemen uh, is, is holding a towel, a little towel. And he walks over to the man and gives him the towel, and the man, um, you know, puts it on himself. And I think, whoo, whoo, that's over. That was just a misunderstanding. And, uh, and he says to the policeman, and this, 
<laughs> That's exactly what he said. He said, it's such a beautiful day here. Who needs a towel? And then he threw it in the air. And then the policeman attacked. They came in and tackled him and took him away. And I thought, the body is dangerous. The body requires backup and squad cars. The body is, you know... This is this is serious stuff. So I thought if this is this is the stuff of poetry. So so you'll notice that a lot of these poems are about the body, um, and I dedicate them to that man, whoever he he is. He's a hero. Um, this is called the the secret of tragedy. The yellow of an apron in Vermeer describes a healthy lymph node's glow, which sometimes bloats to crab apple size, protrudes from the tree of the body. In this Vermeer, it's the milkmaid's youth, the tassel of milk, that moved me to think of her death. Even the paint on the canvas is cracking, thinking of death, because everything we see has long disappeared it appears to deeply shine. The trick is to witness my own fall like that. Whatever is born must learn to grow heavy and fall. And then this is the last poem in the collection. It's called Removal. Yeah. <laughs> Removal. To feel each branching outward part I don't feel each part, though I've prayed to hear the small breath of my cells at Wet Mountain. The aspen grove sends messages and leaf code to its heart, a clutch of roots. Mildew zones out in the provinces. Burn up, burn up, the yellow aspen says, burn up, which is another way of saying remember who you are as you move in your beautiful arched upward body believing yourself your own kingdom, believing yourself to be only yourself instead of the land. Thank you, everyone. Um, so it's my pleasure to give the stage to Judith Harris. And you're in for a treat. She's a wonderful poet, and as, as well as being a, a, prodigious, uh, a prodigiously gifted scholar, um, her, uh, her collection of essays is called Signifying Pain, and her new book of poetry is Night Garden. Um, and it's a pleasure to be here with you, Judith. David and I met um, in a very interesting way um, at a, um, an AWP convention. No, it was the MLA. And um, in the gift shop, and David was buying, shall I tell them, sure. a tie. <laughs> One of those ties that, you know, you clip on because he realized that he had to quickly interview some people. Um, and all I remember is, is pink, pink like Hallmark cards and, and um, this wonderful man talking to me and buying, oh, don't, buying a tie. Um, I have a poem about a naked person in here too. root. It is always dusk back there. The road deserted, the house quiet. My mother stands at the doorway, tying her apron, her broad face turned to the earth. My father puts down his saw next to the sawhorse and crouches bent to the weeds. Nothing changes not here, memory won't abide it, uncertain if it is memory. The white moon, half rock, half flower, sifted from a recipe, beats back the shadows it causes in those dimming alleys of air between houses. Lightning bugs stagger their deliberate flares while the night breezes make even the canopied oak forget which root it belongs to.
the rock. Once on a Saturday in spring, while my father was mowing the lawn, a rock shot out through the chute, striking my sister as she squatted in the thin loam of the garden, coaxing her pansies with a toy spade, then collapsing onto a pile of mulch. On the way to the hospital, in the front seat of the rambler, my mother applied pressure where a white terry, with a white terry cloth to the gurgling wound, my father leaning hard on his horn and screeching around the curves of the parkway. Later that evening at home, as my sister slept off the ether, the gash sutured, I looked down from my window to watch my father pacing the lawn, flashlight combing his freshly cut grass, the moon shadowing him as he bent to find that rock, turning it over in his palms, then hurling it over the fence into the spears of the woods, the soft membrane of darkness pierced, then flare flailing back with the smallest cries of living, breathing things. <coughs> the God Particle. It is the thing that makes us what we are, what we are. Perhaps it never intends not to be perfect, and yet, here we stand, an imperfect world, with each of us a particle of God. Impossible, I say, but then watch the starling flings itself at the clumped panicle of the crepe myrtle, as if it were desperate, and the two of them, passionate lovers, the beak bending the long stem back, as if to kiss the lips of the blossom, tasting the sweetness of it on its tongue, only to sing of it some cold night when the moon is not here and the journey over. Keats's sensation. I have two romantic scholars in the audience. They know who they are. This is for them. Roberta and Judith. <laughs> the whole bee pumps the flower with delight. I can see the fur on its back quivering as it tastes the cloyed nectar and then hums off into transparency, revealing itself again in the clouds of wide-brimmed hibiscus, satiated and then not and I think this would be Keats's paradise to believe that when the body stops, nothing is left of thought but sense, and what comes will go effortlessly as two joyous flaps of night sharing one wing, and the light's flesh gold-flecked and bared so painfully in between. Rose hips, you've seen those. What comes after the blossom, the fruit? We shouldn't give up hope. There is always another world after this one. Look at the rose after the flower has faded. The fleshy fruit sacks appear in their place on the stem. Look closer, some are bottle-shaped decorative as a sarcophagi or prickly as a pineapple with one saber extended as if challenging you to a duel. These are the rivals of the bloom, the corpse after the corpse. All Souls Day and darkness has fallen the moon beckons. The singular birds erupt into dusk songs, and two mottled leaves from the same stem of ivy sprout from the brick's mortar. 
The sicklier one trembles while the healthier one stays green and barely spins or flutters. How they nearly touch each other's tethered edges like two hands of one person. And here in the shadows, I can close that distance with a squint of my eyes. I can catch their desire as if I knew that desire. What wondrous souls we are to want what they want. And into some darker poems. And then I'll close. Scar. It looks like a fishbone or a railroad track, a pinkish horseshoe, or a sunset fading into the horizon. Over the years, it has diminished, stitch by stitch, where the scalpel went in, and they took out the tumor, blinking like a lighthouse. That thing could have killed you, the pathologist said. After studying it under the microscope and dropping it with his tongs into a specimen jar. Now it is only a brazed line, a canceled letter, a rancher's brand on a calf's flank. Reflected in the mirror, I can even crack it into a smile. But don't believe me. It won't wash off on its own. The body was made to preserve it, like a soldier protecting a tomb. Regress. On the day I graduated from saltines to toast and could manage a few laps around the bedroom, with the two transparent tubes and needles stuck in my arterial veins, my mother showed up at the door, demanding I take my wig off so she could see what I looked like now that, that my hair had all fallen out, each eyelash curl, each inch of peach fuzz gone, her face cocked in the way the Parkinson's had set it, like a wind-up toy missing a part, her pants too short and socks lewdly unmatched, her turquoise eyes sparkling as she gripped the banister, sturding herself, leaning on her avuncular cane. So I yanked the wig off and stood there with my rolling IV, as if this were some kind of accomplishment and she did not flinch or shudder the way she did at the sight of blood, but instead kept staggering toward me as if she wanted to rock my bald head in her hands, as if she, it had now occurred to her, you are my beautiful baby. A memory, and then I'm... I'm going to close with a few. Those years after dogwoods and purple flocks, the color of dyed Easter eggs, the screen door rattling like a nerve, on the porch a cardboard box for stray cats who stayed just long enough to swell and give birth. So simple my mother home from the stenographer pool, starlings in a mass over the rooftops, the late night pulling us in like a magnet, the moon baying, the solitaire trail of cards. Nothing could budge us from our own cushions where we stayed nested, eating tuna sandwiches, just she and me floating on TV laughter, her hand clasped over mine like a first date's. And I'm going to close with just two last poems. This is called Evening. 
It is time to be tired now. It is time to be quiet. The cherry tree is drunk on breezes. Its blossoms clot the air or bleed into dust. Light will not fail us, nor will darkness. They come like sheep, they turn like pages. I will pull down the shade, it is night now. The fig has sprouted new leaves. The stars glitter on and on. And if prayer counts, I will pray to be lifted and ask that morning deliver more light. And tomorrow I will look out at the bright world to see if something brighter has listened. And finally, a poem called Patience. Inside my crowded garage are shelves of bright metal nails, some tacks and brads, a dazzle in big and little jars, ones filled with baby food, jars going back 20, 30 years, packed together like iron magnets or steel jacks, the aluminum ones as though peering out of the darkened glass like stars. The years pass by them indifferently, waiting for some shingle to fly off or to warp like a drake's wing, that floorboard to finally crooken. Some miracle or disaster demanding I build or repair. Perhaps the moment will finally come when, taking their turns, they can bear down like the sun, slender and pointed, heads silver to brackish brown, flat or curved or skewed, to let the hammer blaze above as if the sky were one hand and the gloved earth were the other, laying down slats of rutted pine to make of themselves a house that will hold as long as there is time. <laughs>